first we're going we're gonna to do some reading out of Genesis. I'm going to go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, where we're going to start verse 9. Anyway, I'm just glad that uh, I'm glad that <clears throat> that I'm in a place on my job where I can share the gospel with people, and that I have an opportunity to do Bible studies out there. And God's growing that, and He's giving me more opportunities to reach more people there. And uh, there's always fears that seem to come with that. At least for me, there there is because you just never know who you're going to offend in the process. Uh, if your employer is going to step in the way, if he's going to give you a problem with what you're doing. And uh, there have been some obstacles uh, just in the past two or three hitches since I've been out there. But every single time, you know, God just, God works it out. He always makes it work out somehow. Um, anyway, I, last time I got in too deep into what was going on in my job and I ended up speaking, I think, an hour and 15 minutes. That's not going to happen tonight, I promise you. <laughs> Seriously, I promise you that won't happen. Maybe an hour and ten minutes. <laughs> no, I think I can do this in 15 minutes, well, 30 minutes. Maybe 40 minutes, I don't know. We'll see. It's not going to go that long. Okay. Genesis 2, verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to the water to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became in, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it, which compasses the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Delium and onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. I might not be pronouncing these right, but I'm just going to go with it. The same as that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth forth, goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall surely not die. You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. <clears throat> and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree wherever I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The servant beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return into the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins, and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden till, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It's a lot of reading, I know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I wanted to start out making a few points um, in Genesis 2, 9, verse 9, and then again in verses 16 through 17, there's references made to the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life. And it's interesting, um, when I look deeper into studying the tree of life and what it actually means, um, well, not what it actually means, but the word of. With the word of there, between tree and life, I know it's real simple, but it actually is a continuing thing. Tree of life, it was something that was going on. As long as that tree was accessible to them, they would live. And they would never see death. And so because of their sin, they had to be removed from the Garden of Eden. They had to be taken away to where they could not any longer have access to it. Because there was a shift that took place. There was a, a, a significant shift of dependence. They were at one time dependent on God completely. And then once they ate from the tree of knowledge, good and evil, their eyes were open to some, a whole new world around them. And then there was a new dependence. And just like the serpent had told them that they were going to be as gods, if you look up that word God, what, it, what he's referring to, it takes on a few different contexts. But the one that I see is Elohim. That word God there, I know the King James shows it as a small G-O-D, but when you look up the actual Hebrew word there, in the variety of contexts that it can take, one context is it can be God himself. And so they were going to be as if they were God. They would view themselves as if they were God. And so that's where the significant shift really took place was that they were no longer depending on God himself. But now they were going to be tempted. And they already did when they disobeyed God. They began to depend on themselves, thinking that they knew better than God. Knowing good, knowing evil, knowing what was right, what was wrong, what was good for them and what was not good for them. And so in Genesis 2... Verses 21 through 25 is where it says that they were naked, but they were not ashamed. 
They didn't have any shame whatsoever in the fact that they, they had no clothes. They were just running around the garden just like animals were. And there was no shame in it. They were doing it before God. And then later on, in Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, they sowed the leaves and then they were actually hiding from God. And so it goes with the shift from dependence on God completely. Now they're depending on themselves. They sinned. Their eyes were open and they started to see that, that they were naked. And now perversion entered in. Now they were exposed to all the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes. They were exposed to the pride of life. They were exposed to everything that the sinful nature is now being bent toward. <clears throat> it says in Genesis 3 verses 6, in Genesis 3 verse 6, it says that they saw that it was good for food, the tree of good knowledge and evil. They saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. They saw that it was desire to make one wise. And so this here is a, a parallel in Matthew chapter 4 where Satan was tempting Jesus. He takes them and he, and he uh, shows them some stones and he says, why don't you turn these stones to bread? He was fasting, so he knew he was hungry. He was hitting them where he knew that it would definitely be a strong temptation. And so that was the lust of the flesh. He was tempting him in the area of taking him up to the top of the pinnacle, in the area of the lust of the eyes. He showed him all the kingdoms. He showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, and he said, "If you cast yourself down from here, won't the won't the Lord save you?" It's, you know, and he quoted a scripture in Psalms where he says that if you cast your foot against a stone, he'll he'll keep you and he'll he'll keep you from falling. And so he's he's using all of the same tactics there. It's the same thing over and over again. Everything that we face, every sin, every struggle, it's all going to fall into those categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And um, Satan can be seen in the garden. And I didn't realize until I did a Bible study offshore, and, and we were doing a similar study like this, and, and we were talking about the serpent, and and you know, there are some people, church people, that don't realize that the serpent, I mean, the snake itself was not Satan. I believe that Satan took over the serpent, that he entered the serpent. And um, scripture shows that, uh, that it is possible, uh, you know, Satan entered Judas and uh, he possessed Judas to do what he did at some point. The Bible, the scripture actually talks about when he entered into Judas. And so uh, we know that angels have that capability, fallen angels for sure, to enter into somebody and to take over their, their being. And um, also uh, there's some other strange things that have happened uh, where Balaam and his donkey, uh, when God told Balaam uh, what to do and, and he didn't follow the instructions of God, he told him pretty much that he wanted him to wait to hear from God before he went on. And, and he went on and he was going to go meet with some people that, that God had not yet given him the go-ahead to do. And so the donkey was moving forward and there was an angel of the Lord in the spirit standing there. And so the eyes of the donkey were open to where the donkey could see it. But uh, Balaam couldn't see it. And so the donkey, I mean, the angel had a drawn sword. So that donkey was like, I'm not going that way. And so the donkey was trying to go a different way. And... Um, Balaam was angry, you know, he was really mad because he, he, he didn't have a place to go, he had things to do. And so he smote, you know, he struck the, the donkey. And uh, he did it three times. And then finally the donkey just fell down to the ground. And, uh, and then God caused the mouth of the donkey to open up and the donkey spoke and said, you know, why are you, why are you striking me? And so we can see through these examples in scripture that, uh, you know, there's some really unusual things, things that are not common to us, but that they do happen and that they can happen. And so uh, in other places in Scripture, in John 8, 44, uh, Satan's referred to as a liar and a murderer from the beginning. That was a reference to the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and chapter 20, verse 2, 
Uh, he's called Satan the devil, the old serpent, the deceiver of the whole world. <clears throat> In Numbers chapter 21, we can see a symbol of the cross, but we can also see a symbol of Satan present through that, where Moses raises up the brazen pole, and uh, or the brazen serpent on the pole. And that's uh, the source of salvation to the Israelites that day after they had rebelled against God. And then God cursed them with these snakes that were poisonous and they were attacking the children of Israel. And so again, we can see the reference to the serpent there, the curse that the devil brought into the world. And then of course, the overcoming power of the cross, we can see there. And then Jesus later on making reference to that and comparing the manner in which he was going to die on the cross to that salvation that was offered to the Israelites whenever he, when Moses lifted up that serpent on the stick. And so it's clearly illustrated and that, that Satan, uh, if you want to believe that he was the snake or that he took over the snake, I see that he took over the snake. I believe that's what it was. And uh, that he entered into the snake. And so the curse that came on the snake, you know, we read it, that he was going to no longer be, um, well, he said you're going to be crawling on your belly. So you can make some conclusions from that, um, that the snake may have had legs. I believe that the snake had legs. I mean, scientifically, there's things that show uh, some strong support to that idea. Uh, the python, I don't know if you know this, but the python actually has pelvic spurs. It has uh, pelvic leg spurs that would accommodate legs. Of course, you know, no time known in, in our history do we know of any snake that has legs, but uh, even uh, evolutionists believe uh, in their wrong way of believing it. They believe that snakes at one time had legs, and of course creationists would believe it also. And uh, there's actually in that pelvic on pythons, they have, it's almost, it looks like a little tooth almost. And it has the ability to kind of help grip when they wrap around their prey and to hold it tighter. Um, so I find that, you know, interesting and a good way to illustrate it. And we see in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. And he says that he became sin for us through what he did at the cross. Uh, we drew. We were able to draw near through the blood, through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. We're able to come close to Christ. And it says that He bore our sins on the tree in First Peter two four. He became a curse for us in Galatians three thirteen, when He was on the tree, because the, the Mosaic law said that anyone that hangs from a tree is cursed. And so that's why it was such a stumbling block for the Jews to be able to accept that Jesus could possibly be the Messiah. You know, the main point of this whole message, the, the, the main, the primary points I want to get across is not that a python had legs at one time and not necessarily that uh, Satan is the snake or he took over the snake in the Garden of Eden, but deception. There's so much deception, and I know from this, uh, from the Bible study that was in place before this church and uh, just preached up here a lot, is just deception. So many different manners of deception. There's so much out there. And it's so interesting, the concept of deception, because nobody thinks they're being deceived. Think about that. Nobody thinks that they're being deceived. I mean, I could be standing up here preaching something that's absolutely wrong, and I'm going to tell you now, I don't think I am, you know, because when if you are deceived, you really, that's the whole concept of it. Amen. And there's so much, there, there's so much of it in the church. There's a preacher, and I'm not going to say his name, I'm not going to do that tonight, I'll do it another night. But um, <laughs> I will refer to him. And I'm going to tell you what, when I first started in, in ministry and I first started preaching, this preacher was one that I had a whole lot of respect for. And, and I would listen to his messages, lots of his messages, because they really spoke to me and, and they ministered to me. And just recently I found out, and I, I, it's not just something I read, it was something I saw, you know, he was actually, I saw it on video, and he was actually, he had wrote a new book, and I don't think it's new anymore, it's, it's been some time. But in this book, he's, he's uh, writing about the Jews, and he's, he's saying that, that Jesus is not the Messiah. And I, 
I'm trying my hardest to wrap my head around that. I'm like, I really looked up to this guy and I really had so much respect for him. And it, it's just amazing and, and clear. I mean, it's very clear in Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus even referred to himself. He self-proclaimed that he was the Messiah. And so anyway, that, that's just one small example, but um, there's so much more. Um, so let's get to the doctrine. Um, I wanted to, you know, I focused on the garden, the fall and everything, and the deception. It's, it's just the deception that, that Satan imposed on Eve, which was in turn imposed on Adam. And now the whole human race is being affected by it. And there's a group called the Global Peace Foundation, and that was uh, one of the uh, one of the groups that I noticed that he's associated with. And um, they preach and they teach universalism, and uh, what that is is uh, they call it the wideness of God, the wideness of His mercy. In other words, God's so merciful that whether you believe in Jesus, whether you even know about Jesus, if you're not even aware that there is such a person and who he is in history and the role that he plays, as long as you believe in God and you want to be good, you know, it's that secular humanism, that new age idea creeping into the church. And so because God's mercy is so wide, you know, as long as you adhere to that much, just believing that there is a God, you'll be saved and you'll be okay. You can go to heaven. And so it takes the folks away from Christ. It takes the folks away from Jesus. And so he's connected with this. He's, he's associated with that. And so they teach that all religions are one family under God. John 1.12 says, to as many as received him, That's speaking right. about Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And the word right there in the Greek means power. Amen. It's the miracle of salvation. Yes. It's the miracle of the changing of the nature. Thank you, Jesus. It's, it's something that can only happen by a miracle. Amen. It's, it's really that impossible. No more than you can take the bark out of a dog. No more than you can make a cat stop purring or meowing. <clears throat> it's, it's impossible. It's impossible with man. It's impossible. Satan himself can't do it. Okay. Only God can do it. And so they refer to this, uh, everyone is one family under God. It's the universal Christ of the new age. Hmm. In fact, this particular, uh, this particular minister, his father at his church, when he was still alive, he's not alive anymore, uh, he was bringing in a guy to speak on occasion. He's a new age speaker. He's like one of the big guys in the new age movement. He would bring him into his church and let him speak to the whole congregation. Uh, the new age guy's name is Gerald Jampolsky. I don't know if you or any of you are familiar with him. And uh, what he was teaching, uh, not, in, not when he went to the church, but this is what he teaches. This is like some of his doctrine is that he teaches that there's no sin that the slain, uh, he said, yeah, that there's no sin, that man's not really affected by sin, and that the slain Christ really has no meaning in the life of a person. And so that's who they're bringing into the church. The Reformed Church of America is another group. Um, the guy that was actually at the church, the, the son that I was, the minister, that's the son of that, that guy, um, He's affiliated with the Reformed Church of America. And uh, I saw this at his website. He likes to talk about the church without walls, the church being a church without walls, um, a church that reaches out to the community. Um, and in these outreaches in the community, it's very important, they say, that you stay away from Excuse me, you stay away from the, not, the offensive uh, words uh, such as sin and the cross and hell and uh, judgment. And so that's what the incarnational love of Christ is that they're referring to. And being a church without walls is, you know, going out and ministering to people's needs, uh, the physical needs. You know, when people are hungry, you go make sure they have food. But there's no mention of the cross. There's no mention of the sin 
nature. There's no mention of the need for Christ, you know. And so meeting the immediate needs and, and just leaving their spiritual condition as it is. Uh, you may not realize because of where we live just how rampant this kind of teaching is. It really is rampant throughout the United States. It, yeah. it is. Um, since I've been doing these Bible studies offshore in my rig, uh, people that have been going to those Bible studies have been asking me questions about what I think about certain ministers or, or teachers. And it's it's on the it's on the TV every Sunday, you know. If you just flip through the channel on the rig, you know, through the channels, and you can find all these teachers of the Word of Faith movement teaching a lot of a lot of these uh, false doctrines. And um, I find it it's it's really a challenge because this one lady she uh, she was asking me about one in particular. She, and she said, uh, you know, what do you think about this guy, him? You know, I like him. And I said, I'm not really a fan. I'm not a fan of him. And I said, here's the reason why. And I've been writing these devotionals, putting it on a card, you know, where I can just hand it out to people. And I've been noticing that uh, when they come and ask these questions like that, almost every single time, one of those devotionals that I wrote just, I mean, just hits it right on the head. And so I'll just go get it and give it to him and let him read it because I don't always have the time to talk to him and explain but um, back to the Reformed Church of America, uh, this is the affiliation that his church is with, you know, um, just like uh, our church is affiliated with Swagger Ministries, um, kind of like have an umbrella that you're under. They're underneath the Reformed Church of America. And in 2014, uh, the board, their, their board in this Reformed Church of America got together and they wanted to discuss um, how they were going to handle homosexuality as it's interpreted in Scripture. And what they decided at the end of that meeting was that homosexuality is not even sin per Holy Scripture. Yeah. In 2015, they got back together and they wanted to revisit a discussion on that. And... Um, when I was reading this, I was thinking maybe, you know, somebody stood up, maybe somehow it got better. And what happened was they approved a study. With, this is what they accomplished at the end. Okay, we're going to come back next year. And we'll, we'll, in the meantime, we're going to be doing proposals for some studies on how we can go forward on this issue of human sexuality. So there was no change. There was no change whatsoever. They're just going to look for a way to repackage this thing and how they were going to present it to their churches. And there was a lot of opposition to it. Churches that were a part of this group that pulled out. And they, they were like, we're not going to have anything to do with it. You know, they saw it right away for what it was. So, um, this is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. It's very deceptive because, and, and this is the only reason it is deceptive to anybody, okay? And I don't mean this to be ugly or rude, but it's because they don't know their Bible. If you're deceived by something like this, it's because you don't know your Bible and you don't have the proper fellowship with the Lord. If, if you do know your Bible, if you do have that kind of understanding, you can, you can recognize, you can recognize it right away. Yep. I mean immediately. <clears throat> So there's there's been there's been lots of struggle with that, and, uh, and and I'm seeing it you know surface on my job. There's just so much deception out there. Have y'all ever heard uh, the story? It's a really interesting story about a lady uh, from England, Lady Anne Grimston. Have y'all heard the story about her and her death and her grave site? Okay. I can't believe y'all haven't heard that story. It's a really good story. I'm going to read, read the story to you. The story of Lady Anne Grimston, the most popular tourist attraction on the grounds of St. Peter's Church in Tewin, Tewin, England, is a tree. The church dates back to Saxon times, 
and is an interesting structure in itself. But what people from around the world come to see is the massive single tree with four trunks that grows over the grave of Lady Anne Grimston, who was buried more than 200 years ago in the ancient parish churchyard. Who was this English lady, and how did this strange massive tree take root and grow over her gravesite? It is a very interesting story, which I reproduce here for the benefit of TIA readers. In a great house in Hertfordshire County, Lady Anne Grimston lay dying. She was a proud, obstinate woman who had enjoyed her wealth and lands as well as the society of her friends. During her long life, she had paid little attention to the more important things which do not pass away. And so she died as she had lived without faith and the consolation that comes to God-fearing men and women who leave this world, prepared to stand before the dreadful judgment seat. She believed that there was nothing else in this world except the life she had lived. Her riches, her grand house, her friends, the fine dinners, and elegant clothes she had enjoyed. After she passed away, there would be nothing, she claimed. There was no eternal life of the soul, no heaven, no hell. Her friends tried to point out to her how terrible and impossible this was, how certain it was that she would live another life, just as the roses die back in the winter and then live again, just as the trees and flowers in the field come to life again, and after their long sleep, so also her friends told her would she, Lady Anne Grimston, continue to live, and that the life that was in her would never end. But Lady Anne Grimston was proud and unbelieving, and she said to her friends, I shall not continue to live. It is as unlikely that I shall continue to live as that a tree will grow out of my body. She went so far as to make a challenge to heaven, saying, If indeed there is life hereafter, trees will render asunder my tomb. Lady Anne Grimston died and was buried in a strong tomb of marble. Buried and forgotten, but not quite. For one day, many years after the marble slab over her grave was found to have moved from its position, the builders fixed it firmly back in its place and left it, thinking it quite secure. Again, the heavy marble slab tilted slightly on one side, and in the middle was a crack with a tiny bunch of leaves bursting through. The crack was closed with cement, and the slab put back. But again, the slab was lifted up, the crack opened wider than ever, and the thin trunk of a tree appeared. They repaired the crumbling tomb and built tall iron railings around it to hold the masonry together. But the young tree made its way, breaking the masonry in two, destroying the walls. destroying the walls of the tomb and tearing the heavy iron railings out of the ground. And today, growing right from the heart of Lady Anne Grimston's grave in St. Peter's Churchyard in Herefordshire County is one of the largest trees in England with four trees growing from one root. The trunk of the tree has grown fast through heavy iron railing which cannot be moved. The marble masonry of the tomb has shattered to pieces and today, Lady Anne Grimston's grave is a heap of broken stone and twisted iron bars. For over 200 years, the trunks have forced their way through the tomb to raise the branches in a silent but powerful triumph. <laughs> God is real. Amen. And there is an eternity. And the deception that's in the world around us, we, we can have confidence and we can know and, and we can move forward and we can speak out in that same confidence. And we have to, because if we don't, deception is going to continue to grow. Sure. It's going to grow one way or the other, but in our world around us, it doesn't have to grow so rapidly. Let's pray.